Welcome to Almost a Disaster, Episode 2. This one, we're going to talk about Japan Airlines Flight 2 and automation confusion. You may have heard of the Miracle on the Hudson. In fact, you probably have <clears throat> if you live anywhere in the United States. But have you probably never heard about Japan Airlines Flight 2, which landed in San Francisco Bay back in 1961? Now, Japan Airlines had been operating the DC-8 for several years when this accident happened. In fact, they used over 60 DC-8s over the next 27 years uh, during the time period when they operated the DC-8. And uh, the airplanes were quite nice, uh, <clears throat> how they were fitted. Uh, they had a special lounge that was like a Japanese-style lounge for the passengers. And it was just a very nice passenger experience overall, especially being Japan Airlines' first jet that they had. Now, this accident uh, took place in 1968. And here's a map of San Francisco International Airport and San Francisco Bay showing the site of the accident, which happened on 22nd of November, 1968, where we had a crew with a Japanese captain, Captain... Asso, we had first officer Hazen, who was a U.S. citizen, a flight engineer who was a U.S. citizen, and a Japanese navigator. And the airplane was called the Shiga. It was brand new, built in May of 1968, so only a few months old when this happened. It had 96 passengers on board and seven cabin crew members. Now, the weather was poor that day, so the captain was flying an approach that he thought it was auto-coupled with the uh, autopilot and the flight director. And in the top left here, you can see the Sperry attitude indicator. And you can see some of the flight director bars and some different flags showing here. The um, flight director bar apparently uh, was basically had deceived the pilot in this case. Uh, it had misinterpreted the information that his information that he was getting on the instrument and mistakenly thought that the airplane was on the glide slope when in fact it was not actually coupled to the glide slope it was only coupled to the localizer and if we take a look um, at the enunciator the enunciator panel this is a DC-8 cockpit and it would have been right here approximately for the captain to see um, he had seen that the localizer had captured and was coupled with the autopilot and was flying the approach correctly, but he didn't notice that the glide slope had not actually captured properly. And if we look at how an ILS is set up, we have an outer marker, a middle marker. The localizer provides horizontal guidance from side to side, and the, ver the glide slope provides vertical guidance up and down. Uh, it's common practice at the outer marker as you hit the glide slope crossing altitude to check that and double check it. Now when I fly an instrument approach, if the glide slope is not within about 200 feet of the glide slope crossing height, which is published for the pilots to see on most approaches, then it's time to execute a missed approach, add power, and go around for another try, or at least query ETC and make sure the glide slope is working while you're doing a missed approach. But for whatever reason on this day, as the autopilot had coupled to the approach, uh, the first officer did not make the normal call out to check that the glide slope was in fact showing the right height. And unfortunately, as the airplane came even lower, when they broke out of the clouds, which visibility that day was only about three quarters of a mile, the first officer called out, we're too low, pull up, pull up. And the captain began to apply power, but as he did that, as he was rotating, the airplane settled and came to rest in about nine feet of water, about two and a half miles short of runway 28 left, which is where they were intending to land. Thankfully, this was in the daytime. It was at about 9.24 in the morning, and so the passengers could see what was going on. But most of them uh, had no idea what had happened until they looked out and saw all the water. Thankfully, though, the airplane didn't sink because it basically just sat on the bottom. And the flight uh, 
attendants began to get the passengers ready for an evacuation. The airplane um, didn't really sink, like I said, so the evacuation was quite calm. The passengers were reported to have just been standing around taking pictures. So here's one of the pictures that was taken. Um, you can see the passengers don't really look panicked or anything as they exit the airplane. Um, but they basically all executed... I don't think anybody even really got their feet wet. And everybody stood around trying to figure out what to do. Well, 55 hours after the landing happened, uh, United Airlines took, uh, basically received the airplane at its dock because they were able to lift the airplane out of the bay about 55 hours later and take it over to, Japan, uh, to United Airlines maintenance facility at San Francisco airport and they were contracted to make repairs to the airplane. So this was in November 1968. Well, by the end of March 1969 and $4 million, 52,000 man hours later, the airplane went back to Japan Airlines where it actually spent its next 14 years flying with Japan Airlines. And it had quite a nice uh, life for the rest of its time there. There was significant damage to flaps and other parts of the airplane that had to be repaired, including the galleys. There was some water that definitely got into the airplane and damaged a lot of electrical, electrical things. But it uh, the Shiga did go on and fly for 14 more years with Japan Airlines. And that wasn't even the end of the line for it then. Um, it went to a couple cargo airlines and eventually ended up flying for Airborne Express. And it flew for Airborne Express till December of 2001. So it had a really good and long life. Uh, thankfully, where it landed in the bay, it was amazingly miracle water landing, although um, not quite in the same circumstances as Sully Sullenberger and the miracle on the Hudson. So now you know the story of the Shiga and maybe the first miracle water landing, miracle ditching of an airplane in the United States since the jet age began. Hope you've enjoyed today's uh, Almost a Disaster Episode 2, and I'll be making a new one in the next few weeks for you guys to enjoy on Episode 3. Thanks. Have a great day.